Welcome to a new chapter in engineering education, where we reimagine the tools of teaching and learning. Among these tools, let's explore case studies to teach engineering principles and to awaken an entrepreneurial mindset in our students. Imagine a curriculum where case studies are more than technical dissections of the past. Imagine case studies as future-oriented narratives of real-world opportunities designed to inspire innovation and value creation. In this journey of educational transformation, the University of Dayton and partners such as iFly are leading the way. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Doug Melton. You get to come out again. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have the pleasure of talking to you about something around case studies. When I think about Keen, there are a bunch of ideas, like the whys that you just shared with your neighbor. You might peer into this word cloud and you might say, oh, there's my word, there's my collection of ideas. But there are two words in here that stand out, and I'm going to bring them up from the bottom, and you see opportunity and impact are two of the key words. When I only have two minutes to talk to someone about this, I talk to them about a mindset of opportunity and being able to, a mindset that's inclined to assess impacts, both positive and negative. And so if we talk about that for just a second, You've probably seen diagrams like this from IDEO and, and captured in literature around opportunity is at the intersection of these three things, desirability, viability, and feasibility. And so it's at the center where you go, there's an opportunity there. And that's the opportunity space and you find out if you don't have one of those elements, you end up in a space where you either can't build, can't sustain, or can't sell the idea. But there's another piece to this that often doesn't show up there that I think connects to our professional identity. And that is the professional responsibility of should we do it? And that's another part of this work. And so you start thinking about it's not just the opportunity space, it's also the impact space of the who, what, where, and when. So those are the two key words that I like to focus on. And then you say, how am I going to get this into my fellow faculty, my students' minds, the minds of people that we work with? How does this become part of the fabric of our work? And so you've got this box usually when you teach a class, you've got a box of technical content that you're trying to fill. You've got a collection of learning objectives and you're going, I'm gonna add mindset to this, how do I do it? What tools do I have in my back pocket to do it? And so you start looking at the cards that you can play. And some of the cards that you could play, you could go into the classroom and you could do a project. Or you could do active and collaborative learning. Or you could do problem-based learning. You could lecture, and that's still good. I'm gonna whisper that, but that's still good. Have you ever used case studies? I bet a lot of you have. And the case studies, when you look at case studies, they might be something like the Kansas City Skywalk. They might be something like Tacoma Narrows Bridge. They might be something like the first car that I owned, which was Keen Blue, but that particular car. The Ford Pinto, it might be the De Gaulle Airport uh, collapse in France. It might be a nuclear disaster. It might be something. And these are serious, important case studies because they connect to one of the things that our professional identity is about. Well-being. Our professional identity is about safety, well-being, but that well-being is not just limited to disasters. And so there is a group, there's a collection of people here there's a collection of people at the University of Dayton who have partnered with a industry partner, iFly, who asked the question, what if this? We're going to be joined by Ken Bloomer and Sid Gunnskaren. And so they're going to join us and talk a little bit about these case studies. 
First of all, thank you for joining us here to talk about this important case study that represents other case studies that you're doing. So let me go back to that slide and ask a few, a few questions. So here's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna have kind of mini panel sessions. First question I had for Ken, first of all, how did you discover this particular industry partner in this process? Well, Doug, like many good things in life, it all began with curiosity because I had driven past this building and um, I'm wondering what in the heck goes on in this facility? And the second time I drove by, my curiosity got the best of me. I had to go in and see what was going on. So when I walked inside, I saw these people flying inside this vertical wind tunnel and I was just amazed. So I sat there and I watched and the thought occurred to me, this would make a really cool case study. Indeed, indeed. So after you, that thought occurs to you, what happens next? The next thing I know, I, I got Sid, and uh, the iFly group does STEM uh, field trips. So Sid and I joined a group of high school students, and we went flying. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, Sid, so you, you went to this iFly facility, yeah. and what surprised you about it? Oh, before even going into the facility, I was marveled at the building. I mean, that building looks so cool. It turns out the entire building is a wind tunnel, so, which is awesome. And then when we went in, we saw this 12-foot massive flight chamber where people were doing some crazy aerobatics like flips and tricks, and it was so cool to see. <laughs> uh, but one thing I noticed as an engineer was like, how is it that people were just walking in and out of the flight chamber so easily while the velocity there is like 100 miles an hour, you know? It was so cool, but I was always, that question ha had, you know, I had in my head, like why, how is it possible? Very interesting. So when you're looking at this and you're thinking case study and you think, when I go back to the university, I'm, I'm teaching my classes, I've got my learning objectives, you started thinking about what you could do. Tell me kind of what happens next. What were some of the thoughts that you had? And you had mentioned something. Yes, so, you know, here's the equation that we all love and hate. Uh, <laughs> you know, this is the famous Bernoulli's principle, Bernoulli's equation, that we, you know, teach our students in uh, undergraduate fluid dynamics, intro to flight aerodynamics class. Basically, it's a theorem that connects pressure, velocity, and height under a set of given constraints and assumptions. So if you know pressure, you can you know, find velocity and vice versa. So in this module, we show a picture, you know, in our class, show a picture of the iFly wind tunnel. So here's the schematic. So you see the red part in the center? So that is the flight chamber where the velocity is at its maximum, right? And we ask the students, uh, you know, calculate the pressure difference that's, you know, acting on the glass walls in the flight chamber. So inside, there's 100 miles an hour. Outside the flight chamber, where people sit and watch you fly, uh, it's at zero velocity. So what is the pressure difference and what is the overall force acting on, say, a standard size door in the flight chamber? And you know, students do the math, and it turns out it's not just you know, one or two pounds of force, it's thousands of pounds of force, and it would take a superhuman strength to open the door. And now we ask the question to the students, how is it then people were just walking in and walking out very easily mm. in the iFly in the wind tunnel? I love your keying into the curiosity yes. piece, especially. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, you've got, um, you've got a collection of ideas. We're relating those to equations. You're building this case study. You're formulating questions. How do you kind of bring this back and make it relatable? Because I know at your institution, you're fortunate to have equipment like this. Right. So this is our University of Dayton wind tunnel, where we do a lot of projects for teaching and research. Um, and wind tunnel is an excellent tool to demonstrate some key fundamental principles. But one thing that I want to communicate is in the way the reason why we developed case studies is because you know we want uh, our, our community to experience iFly and what we can benefit from iFly. But also we want to bring iFly to you, uh, and that's what we did as a part of the case studies. That you don't need a wind tunnel to you know, use some of the modules that we developed. So you can use everything that we have developed, all the videos that we created in your classroom, even if you don't have a facility like this. That's perfect. Ken, I know you and University of Dayton and others have been focused on case studies. So how do you make these, you know, we're all watching this and going, yeah, I kind of could use these. I'm an electrical engineer and I'm thinking, how do I use this? 
But, and I think there are ways. How do I access all this? How do we all access all this? So of course we published all of these on Engineering Unleashed and we did something really smart. We changed all the titles to include case study in the title. So all you need to do is go to Engineering Unleashed and search on case study. And you'll find not only our case studies, but case studies from Jonathan Weaver at Detroit Mercy and other case studies that have been developed. But one thing I highly recommend is taking your students, because I fly locations are all over the country, and if you have one nearby, take your students. We took SID's Introduction to Flight course students uh, to, the, to the iFly wind tunnel, and first we calculate their drag and terminal velocity, but then we go and we fly. And it was an amazing experience. I remember listening to some of the students, can you believe we're doing this in a college course? <laughs> uh, but the experience, when you experience drag, it's a totally different under level of understanding. So talk about experiential learning. And I put a couple of case studies up on the, uh, the screen. Again, all of this content's going to be on card 4,000. All right, so we will get there. You'll, you'll be able to access this all very easily. So one of the things that when I started going through the material, I noticed these are the types of questions. They're scrolling across the screen, like, what are the control systems? How does the conservation of mass and energy apply? What does temp why does temperature matter, and what's the target? and some wonderful content that's like, what advice would you give an engineering student? All of that got contained in these case studies in both assignments, in videos. In fact, why don't we, I wanna show you a little bit, about a minute and 30 seconds of some videos, if that's okay. We took a, we did a little compilation, but I do have a concern. I never want to spoil anything. I'm all about, let's not have a spoiler, but I want to show you just a few clips here. All right. How do you vary the speed of 1,200 horsepower? Whatever, so what do you want to control to? Do you want to, con do you want to control the pressure? Do you want to control the velocity? Do you want to control the mass airflow? You know, those kind of things. The, the world has an unlimited number of other factors and moving parts, and we often can't account for all those. So we have to make assumptions to sort of ballpark those and then formulate an equation that accommodates those ballparks, and that gets us pretty close to the so something that would be useful or practical. Engineering is business. <laughs> uh, you know, very much what you are trying to accomplish is to um, produce a product that helps humanity proceed forward. And you know, that's what all of us do as engineers is try to add to our fellow humans. And um, there is business and dollars that, that flow behind that. What we were after here um, with the tunnel that we built in Austin and, and since then was um, an experience of uh, a customer being able to connect with someone who's in the wind tunnel. And to do that, we wanted all glass. And to create an all glass flight chamber, we needed to get rid of some of that pressure. Um, so what we did is change. <laughs> With that, let's invite the iFly team to join this panel. All right. <laughs> oh, this is good. It's great. All right. First of all, let's start with gratitude. I'm just so thankful for for the partnership that the University of Dayton has developed with iFly around this idea, around this case study, and it's also representative of partnerships that you may develop, and so I think this is just a great example of bridging between academia and industry in a wonderful way. So first of all, let's just get some introductions by name, and maybe you could just say your title. Why don't we start with you, Michelle? Hi, my name is uh, Michelle Brumley. I'm the STEM program manager for iFly, and I'm thrilled to be here with you guys to tell us more about our program and what we've done to make it awesome. Hey, everyone. Anthony Joya. I am an engineering project manager at iFly, and uh, it's, I don't often talk in front of people, but here I am today. So. Terrific. <laughs> Justin Waldron. I'm senior vice president of Wind Tunnel Systems. Good morning, everybody. Eric Owens. Uh, process control and automation. Fantastic. And so let's start off with just a few questions. And so I think, um, why does iFly, Anthony, why does iFly exist? 
why does uh, anything exist? That's a really big question. Um, <laughs> I think the, the most meaningful or appropriate answer for this is framed against what we all do here, which is uh, we solve problems. Um, and we respond to the marketplace. And so the short answer is iFly exists because it can and because it's awesome. Uh, <laughs> the, the slightly longer version, I think, starts with another question, equally as large. Uh, what is the meaning of life? Um, and if you guys are familiar with the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Douglas Adams proposes that the meaning of life is 42. Uh, that's an absurd answer to an absurd question at face value, but when you know that Douglas Adams was a computer scientist, uh, the ASCII file format, uh, 42 is synonymous with the asterisk. And the asterisk in literature stands in for anything you want it to be. So the meaning of life is anything we want it to be. Um, we look around at this landscape of want and possibility as engineers. Um, and oftentimes we get really caught up in the, well, what can we do and how does it work? But we don't really appreciate that want and desire are equally critical, if not the most critical. All living things desire to live. That's the first desire. So we need to eat, live, you know, uh, we, we, we share these wants and desires with each other. We, as a collective, the want and desire field emerges. And so entrepreneurs come in. And they're the ones that map that landscape of desire. And they give us, as engineers, the opportunity to solve problems. They give us the direction, the trajectory, the momentum with which to move throughout this landscape of possibility. So I think, again, iFly exists because it can and because it's awesome, but ex it exists as the answer to so many questions. Um, what is possible and what do people want? And so we answered that question. Philosophical. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tell us a little bit, Justin, Eric, tell us a little bit about the entrepreneurial journey that the company, iFly, has gone through. Sure, so quickly about the history of indoor skydiving. It actually started with a curious engineer at a NASA facility in the 60s who wanted to jump in and see what would happen. <laughs> Turns out they could fly. Um, and throughout the next 20 years or so, it was really developed into something that was appropriate for professional skydivers, military, for training purposes. And it, it was taken by a skydiving entrepreneur who you would think would want to develop you know, the, the coolest, the most powerful wind tunnel that they could. But in fact, what they focused on was making it safe for families and kids and making a repeatable experience for everybody that went and making something that you could put anywhere in the world and doing it all with relatively low cost and uh, efficient components, and that's where my colleague Eric comes into this. So, to me, the real entrepreneurship, you know, started with just the idea from the founder, the notion of a recirculating keyword, wind tunnel. No scaled down model that I know of. Okay. So, it started with a fluid model. Uh, and there was some risk in that. And in the beginning, everything was oversized just to be safe, to make sure there was enough gas pedal to push, right? To move the 1,800 pounds of air per second that it takes to elevate someone. Uh, then the first real model, a working duty model was made and the data flowed back from that and we've been sharpening the pencil ever since. I, I love that, I love that answer and I also think about that first time you fire this thing up and then you say, you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's Mich often me. <laughs> I think they were fighting over the opportunity. All right, all right that's more like it. <laughs> Michelle, I've got a question for you. So, you know, one of the things that we would think about if we were thinking about case studies and if you out there are going, oh, I know a cool case study, you, you often think about the company's like benefit because you want the company to have a benefit. What are some of the expected benefits, if there are any other than altruistic, what are some of the expected benefits that iFly might have? Absolutely, and, and the altruistic benefit is big because um, iFly recognized about 10 years ago that we had an amazing opportunity to inspire students into future careers in STEM. So we started this STEM field trip experience. Um, we bring in primarily K through 12 students, and we start with a STEM class, and then they do a hands-on lab activity. 
We do a very, very cool physics demonstration using our vertical wind tunnel, and then every student has an opportunity to fly one-on-one -on -one with their flight instructor. Now, throughout these last 10 years, we've hosted university and college level students at all of our facilities, but we never had a really set curriculum for them. And we would just make it based upon the needs of that particular class. So I was very excited when Ken and Sid approached and uh, wanted to see if we could do a collaboration. And so for us, it expands our base into this nice um, program that we can use. And we invite all of you to use the case study and come join us at one of our 35 locations because there's truly no other better experiential learning. Um, we can talk about force and motion all day long and then we put you in the wind tunnel and you go, oh, I got it. Um, it's, it's so good. So that's why we do this. Perfect. Justin, the map comes up. We see you've got a lot of locations. Is this, are they all US based? Could you talk a bit, a little bit about, I want the audience to understand the scope of your work. Sure, yeah, uh, they are not. <laughs> we, uh, we have 98 operational locations wow. now. Um, they, are, they are in military bases, the same exact wind tunnels parents and kids are flying in. And they're on Royal Caribbean cruise ships as well. So yeah, we're just about everywhere <laughs> you could imagine us being. Fantastic. I'm thinking, you know, one of the things, this is a unique opportunity for you as, it's a unique opportunity for us. And it's a unique opportunity for you to say something about what you would tell a group of faculty members. And if, uh, Anthony, we'll hear from you first, I yeah. take it. But anybody that wants to pile on and add on, I'm interested, and I think we are interested in what you might share with faculty members that are teaching engineering students. Yeah, so it's probably the most recent student in here. Um, I've thought a lot about what my education was, what it offered me, and what I've done with it ever since. And I always think about the process of learning. And what it, what, that, that's a sacred sort of dialogue and connection between the teacher and the student. And I think starting going back to this this, this desire, this what do we want out of life? Well, everybody wants to live, everybody wants a better life. So as a teacher, understanding what your students want from their education, from the, the, from the discipline and the focus that you are bringing into that classroom, you know, it's not arbitrary. They're there either because they think they have to, but it's part of a bigger desire, it's a part of a bigger want. Um, and so if you can't convey the material, if you're having trouble with connecting with your students, figure out what they want. Figure out what you want, and then and sort of dance in that space with them, um, because there there is a foundation that you can both meet at, and figure out what they can bring to relate to your material, and what you can bring to relate to their perspective. Um, so it's just about relationships, I think, fundamentally. I think you're talking to the right audience. Uh, as you'll learn at the social tonight, this is an audience that cares about students. Anything you want to add? Yeah, I'm going to add in. Uh, so, you know, things like. Bernoulli, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, are maybe a percent of what we actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. And the, the value that I mostly got out of uh, my university experience and what I, what I think you all bring to people like me is, is an understanding of how to approach a problem and how to think. That's really what most of us industry folks get out of the years we spend in school. And yep, we learned Bernoulli along the way, but it's a, it turns out to be a very, very small piece of what we do. And then the other thing that's, that uh, was, was given to me and brought me a lot of value in my life was, um, was the desire for the curiosity, the curiosity of approaching any problem. I'm a civil engineer that turns out was responsible for more low speed wind tunnels than just about anyone in the world. And um, how does that happen? It really happens through curiosity, and that was, that was very much fostered by my education. Yeah. Anything to add, Eric? I got a good one. You got a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so what I would want a faculty member inspiring minds, what, what I would want them to ask would be to look at the same flow path you saw yeah. and ask them, what do we do when the power goes out? And there's no batteries. There's no backup generator. So I'm a controls dude, and, and even I can appreciate it, but the answer is how do you do it, or the question is how do you do it without batteries, without a store of energy? What are the mechanical means and ways you can do that and take advantage of the, the flow path and what you already have in there? We've figured it out. We, we, 
we, uh, we have tunnels that, you know, well, everybody loses power, right? And then we've also got tunnels in areas of the world that do not have reliable power, and they run the machine on a really big generator. Well, what do you do when the generator goes out of gas or diesel? You know, mm -hmm. That would be a question I would ask. I like that. The, the resourcefulness, the entrepreneurial mindset comes into play even in safety. In safety. Situations. Absolutely. Okay. Can I add one more thing? You got one more thing? Real quick. All right. Um, as Justin said, this is all about teaching students and people how to think. Um, and whether or not I ever followed a path into a professional engineering uh, discipline, I would have taken my engineering education with me throughout um, my entire life as a way to just approach being a person, as a way to understand things from first principles. Um, so just remember, your, whether or not someone makes a lot of money being a CEO of an oil company or inventing a new fusion reactor, they're going to be a better thinker because of what you do. So you have a really powerful opportunity to influence just the way people are people. I got one more thing. Is entrepreneurial mindset important at iFly? <laughs> That's a gimme, you know that. <laughs> All right. Well, the next thing you should know about these folks is that they're just one, they represent one case study of many. What we've done is there's a QR code that's up here. We'll also put it on card 4000 that has a collection of case studies that include other disciplines, other areas from other authors. But this particular QR code is connected to case studies that come from the University of Dayton just to highlight some of those things. And the work has been going on in the network since 2012. And it takes various forms. We even have case studies that are podcasts and case studies. But it, it's beautiful because it connects industry, government, it connects us to application. And so the other thing that you'll want to know is that these folks, so I don't know if everyone, but some of these folks, we'll see, there is a representation, and even an iFly table, I understand, yes. at the social tonight, so you can come over. You aren't bringing a wind tunnel over, are you? Okay. <laughs> we, haven't made, right. we haven't made one that small. All right, all right, all right. So with that, Thank you all very much for this panel session. Mm -hmm.